Ukraine grows enough food to feed 400 million people on planet Earth. So when the farmers on the battlefields aren't planting or aren't harvesting, what impact do you think that's going to have? 50% of our grain, for example, wheat, comes from Ukraine. And then when you start putting in the global context of Russia and Ukraine together, not even get into the fertilizer costs and the fertilizer uh, access of base products, you've got a catastrophe knocking and looming on the door for the fall uh, that will be not a price issue, but a supply issue, availability of food for people around the world. And that will be a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe. This is one of the reasons we need to get the farmers in Ukraine back into the field so they can plant and harvest over the next few months. Otherwise, can the G7 countries and all other nations around the world make up for that supply? If you are a rich household uh, in advanced economies or even in Africa, you will adjust to rising food price. Now, if you are a poor household uh, in, as you said, the Horn of Africa, you already spent 80, 90% of your daily income on food. So you don't really have a margin for adjustment except eating less. What we want is basically to pool risk together and we do it with trade and trade diversification. So we may not want to rely just on Russia and Ukraine to, to feed the world. So we need to have not two or three or four big exporters, but 20. First and foremost, of course, it's it's resources, it's it's funding, it's it's money, things that are as flexible as possible because we need to be able to move very quickly depending upon where those pockets uh, and access opens up inside Ukraine, but also where refugees move in the neighboring countries to be able to move with them and to be able to support the governments and the municipalities that are on the front lines of this crisis. Second is in kind. It's everything from mattress, mattresses to beds to blankets to sanitary supplies, all all of that is required. Refugees, the Ukrainians, third country national students, they are leaving the country with very, very little. The third are for companies. Engage your employees. Lots of people want to help right now. And many companies are taking advantage of that opportunity to be able to channel the support in ways that assist organizations like ours to be able to deliver that relief on the ground very, very quickly. And fourth, many companies are also doing a matching uh, competition, which obviously raises increased resources, gets people engaged. Fifth, the pro bono support we've seen from several companies in terms of adding their expertise, their legal advice, their technological uh, answers when we need some help, particularly in trying to be able to put that, that cash system in place very, very quickly. We couldn't have done it without business. And then the final point I would make is use your voice. It's the advocacy. It's talking about why we should care as an international community and why we need to stand together with people in need right now and for the future.